So, so Kate, uh, Kate Hopkins is one of the most accomplished sound editors in the country. She's worked on all genres of TV and film, but being in Bristol, the home of the BBC Natural History Unit, natural history films became her speciality. Her meticulous and imaginative sound design, as well as her dedication to the industry, have been recognised many times for groundbreaking films like Blue Planet 2 and Frozen Planet. She has worked on many wildlife on ones, natural worlds, life in cold blood, life in the undergrowth for the BBC, as well as films for National Geographic and the Discovery Channel. She's particularly proud of her Primetime Emmy for sound editing and the Technicolor Creative Technology Award for Women in Film and Television 2014. She has won three BAFTAs and has been nominated 19 times alongside two Emmys and four Emmys, sorry, two RTS <laughs> awards, as well as, as well as many other awards in the field of sound editing, both here in the UK and abroad. And she's recently been working on projects for Disney Plus, Apple TV and Netflix. So, wow, with all those accolades, quotes, it's really fantastic to have you. Thank you so much for taking time out in your busy um, schedule, working for so many different projects and sharing some of your experience with students. I think this is going to be a really great session. So thank you so much. OK, well, thank you very much. Should I start? <laughs> Uh, well, thank you very much and thank you for inviting me. Um, I hope you're all um, coping in these like very tricky times. And I know it's very difficult for students. Um, I will just start how I started in the industry, which was a very long time ago. Um, I started as a receptionist for a small post-production company in Bristol. Um, I did. I did. I was doing reception. I didn't have any qualifications either, but I um, started as a receptionist. But as my boss was, he was a picture editor. Um, so not only did I answer the phone, type invoices, change the roll, and make endless cups of tea, um, I did work in the cutting room, which meant I worked on mostly the picture side. So this was organising trims from 60 mil and 35, and basically assisting um, Nigel, who was a picture editor. Um, it was a great place to start working because it, we did, there was, it was a small company, but there were, animation went through there. We had Arman Animation at the end of the corridor at that time. So I made them lots of cups of tea as well. And we uh, had documentaries, natural history, some drama. I used to do a lot of syncing up, which is you know, when they film dramas, you have to sync up the rushes, which is you know, picture and sound, put those together. That was a big lot of my job when I first started. Um, it was it was a great start and I was very lucky. And you don't, and it's, I know it's more difficult now getting straight assistant roles, but it was, uh, it meant I worked on, as I said, many different genres. I also did sound, uh, sound transfers and stuff like that. But my, um, when I started, I moved into the cutting room more, although I still answered the phone, I did do a lot of work in the cutting room. And so we, Nigel would cut the picture and I would um, help him out in the picture, but then the sound edit would happen. So he'd do the picture and on 16 mil, I would get all the atmospheres, the effects, and I would lay those up ready for it to go to a mix. And that was sort of my job there. And I said, it was very varied. Um, and that at the time you had to have, if you were going to go freelance, you had to have your union ticket, which I got after about three and a half years, because it does take quite a while. Um, and then I, I went freelance. At the time in Bristol, there was a lot of 35 mil dramas happening, which was very exciting. And they were mostly done for big American companies like Universal. But I was sort of poached from Nigel's and then went on to work there as a freelance assistant editor but then moved over onto the sound and sound on drama was, is very exciting. And I think that's where my passion for sound started because I could realize, I realized what impact um, a sound edit could have. You know, if you put different atmospheres in, if you put different effects in, they move on a story and they add drama. And so everything's not completely left up to dialogue. There is a whole lot of other stuff that goes into making a drama with the sound and obviously the music. Um, I, let me see. And then, yeah, so I, I've, at the time I was still working on film and then, and I was very, 
having worked on drama, I was, there was lots of films that influenced me, which were a lot of Coen Brother films, in it, um, Barton Fink, um, and Miller's Crossing was also a particularly good one. And I think it feels like Apocalypse Now and The Godfather, Raging Bull. These are all films which had very sort of distinctive soundtracks. And every, I mean, Barton Fink particularly, I can remember seeing that and being amazed what you could do with just the sound of air conditioning because it created tension. Each room sounded different. You had one room which was just really loud. And every time we went into the corridor, the sound would change. It's, it's a good film if, to watch if you're interested in sound editing. <laughs> uh, Raging Ball was particularly good because, it, you know, all the punches and stuff used a combination of real punches, but also had lion roars and stuff put in. So it was just a, it sort of illustrated how much you could do and how much um, sort of sound design you could do without it, with it still feeling real, but it was just adding power and drama um, uh, to the soundtrack. I mean, um, I, I, when I was doing drama, I learned about a lot of kind of signature sounds that you could use, which would, like, if you're in a graveyard, you have the sound of um, crows. If you wanted to portray sort of poverty, like a distant dog bark and a children, a child, you know, like a baby crying, and as I said, like air conditioning sort of played at different levels, and also like sudden silence is a fantastic one for just kind of creating drama. So as I said, most of this was on film. I was, I was working on dramas, but I was also still assisting on natural history and doing some sound editing on natural history. And you have to remember at the time, there was a big crossover between film and then it started going digital, which for me growing up on film was quite a thing. I'd never used a computer in my life. <laughs> and I was used to having a china graph and making marks and cutting. And so the move over to uh, digital was quite a thing um, and by that time I was a freelancer you don't really get trained you sort of just have to work on the job so I had people I'd worked with before um, who'd set up their own company called Wounded Buffalo and they had bought one audio file which is what it's called which was very brilliant for people who worked on film because the tracks went the right way <laughs> if you look, I mean for me Pro Tools if I'd gone straight onto Pro Tools that would have been quite a shock because it, it moves in a very different way. So Audiophile was just had dedicated buttons for editing and all it could do was sound edit. So I worked on small things like 909, which just which was a program just um, with which sort of BBC one on kind of, oh my God, there was this accident and what happened afterwards. And they were just little short inserts which were quite good for for me training on audio file because it wasn't a huge whole you know whole program, but it was a funny time because I was still going between cutting rooms and working on uh, like with film and then working uh, digitally on audio file, but that collaboration with Wounded Buffalo worked really well because we were all working on different things. We were still working on dramas. I was working mostly by then on natural histories. I think I did the first. I did a Natural World, which I think was the first one which was done completely digitally. And I remember the producers being really worried again, oh, is this going to sound OK? Will it be the same as film? I said, yes, it will be better, I expect. <laughs> um, so I so went from audio file collaborating with Tim and Max at Wounded Buffalo. And then we sort of, and there were jobs in America as well. I got asked to do a job in Idaho, which was all about wolves. And it was in the middle of nowhere. They had a Pro Tools but it only ever, I think, been used by a musician. There was no technical backup. I'd never used one before. So I actually got the manual out on the plane and I've never read a manual in my life. But I did read the manual and got there. I was sort of sleeping next to my studio and, um, yes, managed to come out with a 90-minute soundtrack all about wolves, which was quite a thing that kept me up at night because it was a very... It was a brand like a very old Pro Tools because it only just it was about ninety four I think, so it only just started. So it was um, a bit clunky, and I worked on it and I was on my own. <laughs> but it all got done, and weirdly, it managed to win Nemi for sound. <laughs> I was quite shocked about that. But it was it was it was a fantastic learning curve. So by the time I came back, um, I was sort of 
very happy with Pro Tools, but I'm still kind of going between Audiophile and Pro Tools. And we sort of, during that time, was uh, when the first Blue Planet series started. And Alistair Fothergill, who's a series producer, I'd never actually worked with him before, but he, he kind of did a test for me. He did a natural world about South Georgia um, in the Antarctic. And I did that and kind of obviously passed the test so I could work on Blue Planet. And that was a fantastic job. There was, um, I think in the beginning, they were interested to see what could happen, saying, because obviously a lot of it's underwater. So th we were allowed to use a certain amount of design. We could, you know, the tiny microscopic animals, you're seeing them in, you know, full screen. So they needed sound to go with them to just to help illustrate their movements. So that was good fun. And I, you know, created all sorts of different sound effects for them out of strange stuff <laughs> but it all worked and it's sort of um and that kind of just sound design thing of you know when when fishes are going past you can make them bigger and you just get that feeling of movement and also the feeling of depth you know when you're going deeper into the water and changing the ambience of it making it basier and then when you get to the top it's all fresher and, and more toppy um so it was a lot of that and that was that was great and it sort of I think it pushed on the sound editing in natural history quite a way and the sound became more important and was a more collaboration I think between the sound editor and uh, the what was going on with the music because obviously music is very important in natural history but we kind of quite like to have a balance there's always a little bit of a fight between um, the sound editor and not and the composer not a fight but you kind of it's nice when you win and you can go, it's okay, you don't need any music over this sequence because I've covered it all. So, yes, yeah, so, I mean, from that, it was Frozen and Blue Planet 2 and Life and the Dynasty series and I mean, all sorts of stuff in between. We got then got asked to do um, the Disney Natures because... Uh, They'd, start, they'd started those up again, which was great because it's a proper feature film. Um, we were allowed to mix in big theatres and and it was for Disney. So so that was quite a thing. And we've, so far, I think I've done, because uh, uh, me and Tim Owens work on those together and we have various mixers who, who do the mix, but they were very exciting. And I think I've done about eight or nine of them now. Um, and then during that time, there was also the Dolby Atmos started coming in, um, which for, there's always been 5.1, which is which is good. And before that, there was surround sound, but and but that never quite worked as well because the surround was always it didn't have the full frequency of everything you hear down the front. It was sort of um, tend to lose its base, but Dolby Atmos, you could have full range of all frequencies, so you could feel completely immersed in where you are. And for natural history, um, being immersed in it is, uh, in the whole environment, is very important. And it kind of takes you to that, is what the producers want to happen, is it takes you to that place. And so if you are in the middle of um, the Serengeti, you can kind of feel that that is where you are. When you go underwater, you can kind of feel that you're right in the middle. Um, that obviously mostly works well in cinema, but there is um, home Dolby Atmos now. But really, I mean, that that's a fantastic thing, but the best thing for sound, sound is to get the right sound and put it in the right place. Um, the tracks I did, even when I was on film, it gives you, it gave me a discipline of you have to you can load, lay lots and lots of tracks, but unless they're right, it, it's pointless. You can't, you, it just gets messy and muddy and you just have to make sure you're putting the right thing in the right place. Um, I think what else, so, excuse me for just hanging on a second. I mean, there were lots of, I, the other thing I was gonna say is when I was, um, uh, when I first went freelance, I did go away and work on horror films, which as a sound editor is an absolute joy because you can kind of do what you like. You're not kind of restricted. All you have to do is make something sound nasty, horrible, scary, and you can use whatever sound effects you like. I worked on a film called Hardware, 
which was um, at the time quite a cult film, very low budget, which is why a lot of things are expected of the sound. There's nothing like a low budget film to put a lot of pressure on the sound editor because they haven't got sort of all the money for the pictures, so it has to be created. And it was all shot in the Camden Roundhouse, um, but we had to create this kind of a post-apocalyptic sort of soundtrack going on outside and the sound of a, um, a sort of robot creating itself, which was great fun. Lots of weird servos from DAP machines and um, were uh, sort of cut up to make the fingers come to life. But that was, that was all done on 35 mil. So without having all the tricks and tools that we've got now, um, so that was, yeah, there's, there's a lot of varied stuff I have done and it's been a joy. Um, <laughs> anything else I, I should talk to you about before I give, because I am going to show you a clip of what I, of a Pro Tools session of something that I worked on, uh, which went out at Christmas, which is the Dynasty's uh, Meerkats. It's not a big action film but it will show a pro tool session and it will um, show the atmospheres and the effects and the foley so there's going to be i'll show you a clip it's got no music on it and it's got no narration on it and it hasn't been mixed so this is this is what i would send on to um a mixer and then he'll get it or he'll she'll get it and they'll you know do all the panning and just the, adjust the levels and uh, so this what, when when I play it, I won't play it yet, but when I do play it, it will show you what I hand over. Um, the other thing I was going to talk about is um, how you start the process of um, on a film or a TV program. Because the best thing I found is um, you talk to the producers before they go away on location, especially for natural history, um, because they can sometimes go away and just be thinking about the visuals. And what's very important is I'll talk to them before they go out and really stress that they have to record some wild tracks and location recordings out there, because although I've got, you know, fanta we've got a fantastic library, we don't have everything. And I don't think anyone wants to be relying on recordings that were done say 30 years ago so although many shoots may have been done out in these places um, new sound recordings are particularly important so usually I give them a kind of uh, a list of we you know they'll tell me what's what the program's sort of going to be about the locations they're going to be in and I can see from what we've got or what we haven't got what we really really need um, and so hopefully they go away and do some sound recording which can I mean it's nice to then get a professional sound recorders to do it. Sometimes that's not possible. And so I have the researcher or the AP uh, assistant producer or someone, sometimes a camera person will go out with a small recorder because you can get very small ones now, which don't take up loads of luggage, which is always an issue um, when going out on location. And they can record stuff. And we are just so grateful when we get stuff back. And it, even if it's not perfect, it's... Um, it's very useful because it can give us a guide of what's actually out there because um, these are places I will never go to. I've been there once. I did go once. I went, um, which was, I will tell you about it briefly. Um, I went on African Cats, which was the first Disney nature I worked on. They did actually have a small budget for sound editors to go out on occasion. And so me and Tim Owens went out. We couldn't quite believe this was happening and went out to the um, Maasai Mara. And we went out and we had someone to drive us around and tell it because we was, what I wanted was recordings of close up recordings of lions, recordings of wildebeest hooves, but not necessarily their vocals. And, and there were lots of other things which weren't sort of quite, you know, weren't obvious. But we did go around, we found some lions, um, well, the tracker, she found some lions that were mating which is brilliant because they don't move very far. They mate, they move, they mate, they move. So we could actually get so close that at the end of the Land Rover, there was a huge big lion there just catching the shade underneath us. And so I put um, Tim, so I had my microphone and 
he said, put your arm out, Kate, and record. So I did, but I couldn't actually see where he was. I just knew I could hear him, and it was so close. But that was scary, but actually it worked really well, and it was a really good panting of a lion. And it was a fantastic experience. But as I said, usually we sound us just sit in rooms and um, we never get to go outside. So that was a fantastic experience. So after um, they've gone out, they come back. Hopefully they've done some wild tracks and we've put them all into our system, log them with some help from the people, on, you know, who were actually out on location. And then talk through with the producer what are you know for natural history what are these animals where are we what time of day what time of year make sure everything is accurate as possible sometimes it's stuff we've got in our library sometimes it's you know a combination of that and location sound they've recorded and create a sound edit which is said then goes off to the mixer um to be pre-mixed and then so all our sound effects are level adjusted as I said and then goes on to the final mix we'll have which will have the music and the narration obviously if it was a drama you'd have the dialogue to sort out as well which I have done you do a dialogue edit clean up all the dialogue do any ADR that's needed but then you get to the final which is when you get the music um, and narration with music what's because what we do more often is um, the sound editors will talk to the composer and if we've got a sequence which is particularly sound effects driven, we, we can talk to composer, go, right, what are you going to put on this? Because it's no point us, although we'll do it, we will, you know, if it's a big thunderstorm, we will create a big thunderstorm. But it's sometimes it's nice that the composer knows that we're going to do how big it's going to be and um, how sort of effectsy it's going to be. So maybe they can kind of change their music or maybe have a gap from the music or if there's a whole lot of bassy effects, they don't put a whole lot of bass into their music or, or vice versa, so that we're not fighting all the time. There will always be times in a final mix where you have to make a decision about what's going to lead, whether it's going to be effects and atmos or music. Uh, sometimes it works with a kind of fine combination. Sometimes it works just having one or the other. But that's the, in a way, that's the joy of a final mix. You get to that point, those, everything is there. You've got all your elements and that's when you can make your decisions. So that's, that's the end point. And sometimes I'm there in the final mix, depending on schedules, um, which can be quite tight. And sometimes you're just moving on to the next job. But uh, yes, we're always around to help out on a final mix. And then that's, that's it, then it kind of, goes off but I will I will I'll play you the, I'll play you some bits I'll just show you the sound edit so this is um I said meerkats which went out over Christmas and as I said it's not a big effectsy um film but it kind of shows you what a sound edit will look like so I'm just going to share this screen so hopefully you can see that so what I'll say, right, let's get on my page. So the blue, little blue dots, uh, they are sound effect, they're effects, which are usually mono. And then the green stuff is atmospheres, which are mostly stereo, although there are some uh, mono ones up here. And then down here, all these tiny little bits of pink are the foley or footsteps. Um, and this is, um, everything that goes into a, a sound edit, as said, bar the music and narration. So I'll play you a bit, and then you can kind of uh, start from, yeah, and see if it makes any sense to you.
Okay. Okay, well, hopefully that sort of showed you sort of how a track lay works. I mean, there was sort of, there's subtle things in there. There's the atmosphere's with the kind of nice birds and stuff. And then you've got the wind turning up, which is kind of all threat. And you, there's so much wind there that that little baby can only just be heard. And in the mix, that baby came down much lower. Um, so it was literally drowned out by the wind. And then there's a lot of times when you do, well, not a lot of times, but sometimes you do hard edits, which is what I did um, with the storm when you suddenly come to an aerial. And that can create quite, it creates a bit of space, but also creates a little um, drama as well. So as you can see, there's there's bits where it's very busy with the atmospheres. Um, and then sometimes it's busier with calls and effects. And sometimes it's busy with maybe just the atmospheres and lots of foliage you know, when the little ones are running around. Um, so that's that. Um, I'll show you another bit. Let's just see. Okay. I think this is a bit busier on the effects. Okay, well, that's just come out of that. Okay, well, that gives you an idea of sort of what a natural history sound edit looks like. I mean, the other things we, you know, especially working on this sort of genre, we do have to learn uh, how, what calls everything makes and make sure we're using the right calls. So, um, I can become quite an expert on animals, mostly during the three weeks I'm working on it. And then it all goes out the window, but I have learnt um, most of the, um, yeah, I can I can kind of make sure that I've done, that, do the right calls. And I learned chimp quite well when I worked on a lot of chimp films. So um, that's kind of it, I think. I mean, if like, just, does anyone want to ask anything? Thanks so much, Kate. Um, should we have a quick break before we go into the, the Q&A section? And then um, there might be a few um, as well as audience questions. Should we do that? Okay. Yeah, yeah, that, that's fine. Yeah. Good. Okay, let's have just a really quick three minute break. Everyone for you to stretch your legs and um, get a glass of water if you need to. So we'll meet back at 13 past 
and if the um, student Q&A group could just put your hands up when we get back and then I'll make you presenters. Okay, see you all in three minutes time. Okay, thank you. So, can the students who are in this week's Q&A group make themselves known to us, please? Wonderful. Thank you, Kai. Um, hi. Okay, I'm back. Anyone? Hi. Just um, getting the student group together. Derek, were you part of it? You don't all have to speak, obviously, as usual, but um, hoping that you all had a time, found a time to meet and discuss how you're going to ask questions or in what order. Um, Jack, John, I can't see you, sorry, give me one second. Um, Pip, are you here? Pip. Okay, that's all the ones I can see. Please put your hand up if um, I've missed anyone out. Okay, great. So Kyle Howell, are you going to start us start off? Uh, hello. Uh, should I turn camera on to make it more human or is that? Yeah, that'd be lovely. <laughs> yeah, go on. <laughs> uh, hello, sorry, I've got like a monitor, so I'm just going to switch you back over here. Uh, can you see me? Is that everything yeah. cool? Hello. Yeah. Hi, um, hi. Nice so we've, we've got a few questions from the Padlet, so I'll just uh, go through them and I'll post them in the um, uh, in the chat as well. So if you like my mic cuts out or something, you can just read it. Uh, okay. So just paste this, uh, this one first. This one's from Lauren. So um, when it comes to approaching the sound design for visuals based in the real natural world, do you aim to represent a, oh, somebody's post, a realistic field recording or are they sort of like fictitious? Like how much is real, how much is fictitious when you're doing a, an edit? Um, for naturally, it's all real. I mean, all the calls have to be mm. absolutely accurate. The atmospheres have to be absolutely accurate. As I said even the time of year, whether it's like somewhere like the Kalahari, if it's pre or post flood, everything has to be absolutely spot on. The time you um, uh, sort of add effects that weren't possibly recorded there are things like thunderstorms and big wave crashes and things like that, because they are sort of, I suppose, generic 
and they are there for the drama. But when it comes to calls and actual natural sound, it has to be absolutely spot on. Sure. And it's um, that it, that's a huge part of the job, actually, because it uh, maybe we've got lots of great sound effects that might or atmospheres that might work. But if it's not the right place, they're of no use whatsoever. Mm. Uh, so, has it ever happened obviously not in a production that you'd have worked on but somebody has used the wrong time of year for the wrong call and then people have noticed like is there any examples of that or yeah. are people pretty oh yeah oh yeah yeah oh no people will notice that you know are yes there are um obviously people who know a lot about birds and sure um and they'll spot if something's sort of in slow in the wrong area and it, it will happen to all of us i mean there are people who are all, all kind of experts and if i've got an atmosphere which is in the right place but it may have one bird which mm. might you know be slight the wrong place and that you have to be very careful of that so it's sort of um yes there are people who will definitely phone up and say yeah sure. <laughs> <the wrong> time. <laughs> uh this one didn't have a name underneath it so if someone wants to like credit themselves oh my uh, chrome's frozen but uh, what what is the major challenge in edit sound editing wildlife? Which barriers do you come across when trying to give sound to animals and natural ambience? Uh, I'm not sure who said that, but thanks for that. It's, it's, it's um, the biggest challenge is getting the it's a combination of um, getting the best recordings that are right for the right place, but also your I mean in a way like like the picture is sort of a the best of of what you've got there. So. Um, you want to make places sound as rich as possible if it, you know if it's a jungle you want to hear as many of those calls and animals even if you don't see them that you know you would find in that area so it's, it's a case of sort of building up um an atmosphere but it but with all the right sounds so it's mm. i think that that is it's a challenge but that's also the joy of it i mean especially if you've got good sound recordings you can make some you know things really rich and you can put just the right call in because it's not necessarily all about the animals that you see right in front of you I mean like our meerkats you know you can hear the sound of zebras coming before you see them yeah. so it's adding perspective and drama and also if they move from one location to another which is a lot to do with storytelling you have to change the atmosphere slightly even if you're in the same place you change the atmosphere subtly so you know that maybe that group of animals is a bit further away from that one. You change the insects or you lose the wind. It's um, it's always, you know, getting the geography of a place is very important. And that's kind of, that's mm. always, a, that's a challenge as a sound editor. But it's also, as I said, putting the right calls in, but knowing that you, there is drama going on there and you have to, you know, if, if an animal's dying, you have to, you have to find calls that illustrate that. And you sort of as said you're trying to be as accurate as you possibly can. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you you mentioned before about like you wanted to record the wildebeest hooves, but without the vocals. So obviously you can't tell them to shut up. Like you have to. So no. how, how do you manage that? Um, uh, we were really lucky. The they were a fantastic, but they were all um, going to do a water crossing, you know, river mm. crossing, which is what wildebeest do all the time. When they're um, when they've got there, they make a huge amount of eh, 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 all that kind of noise. But when they're actually running towards it, they don't actually make the call that much. So we just found this bit, and it was just a track, and we just parked up, and they were just all going past us. And occasionally there was the odd honk, but there was loads of it, and it was just their hooves on slightly mm. hard ground, which was perfect because we could hear them all. So it was. Um, it, that's kind of luck but I knew that's what we wanted because you can do um foley of you know mm. hooves moving and stuff but if you've got the real thing as well it adds it adds so much to it if you can have uh, that that kind of real sound so we were kind of lucky on that and the um oh we had one with like a uh, vulture took off without calling which was because usually they just make all this noise but there, yeah. there was this old kill it stank oh the smell of it was horrendous but this um vulture just took off and it's just a beautiful sound of just wing beats really big wing beats going off and they're like record they're like gold dust of those kind of recordings <laughs> and it's mm. kind of only a sound editor will know that is what i want to hear i want the real sounds of real wings yeah. flying off because you can uh, replicate them but getting the real stuff is great and you can always have a combination of things like with the the world of running 
I put that track in. I've got various tracks of that which I add. But then you know, when you get to a big close up, then you have Foley. Mm. Yeah. Um, someone's asked an interesting one in the chat. I don't know. Do you want to? I don't know how to pronounce the name. Sorry, Melia. I think. Um, do you want to do the question, or do you want me to ask it? Um, it's up to you. Do you hear me? Yeah. I can hear you. Okay, sorry, the ventilation of my computer is very high. Yeah, I was asking this question about the planes because I, I guess like the way you treat the like the kind of fiction uh, in those uh, film, like you, you might want to clean all the human sound in order to focus on the animals, but isn't it this cleaning a bit um, like uh, putting away uh, the relations that? Uh, like um, yeah, places can have between animals and and humans. Uh, you know what I mean? Like you want yeah, no, to clean yeah, everything, I, but also it, it puts away kind of a ecological aspect uh, that might be there. So I was just wondering. Yeah. No, absolutely. There um, because I know there are some places where they filmed, and you turn around and it's just there are loads of people around and um. And sometimes we do illustrate that, especially if you kind of, you know, there's usually kind of a making of. But a lot of these places, we try not to do that too much. I think in the past that happened a lot when you just clean up, you kind of sort of deny there are any humans around at all. Some of these places, um, you know, like the meerkats, there aren't that many people, right? There are people, mostly not the background noise of humans you get would be a sort of Land Rover uh, kind of going past. Um, but I do know what you mean, but we try most of the recordings I've got actually because of where they have been recorded don't have lots of chat on them. But I do know that there are some locations uh, which are more tricky. I mean, North America can be tricky because you've got aeroplanes aer going over and, you know, something like Yellowstone, you've got sort of there are tourists around. I think it's when it's uh, when. Um, animals are kind of actually cheat by jowl with humans. I think in a lot of the films I've worked, like Planet Earth 2, we have definitely shown that. And then we did one um, which was urban, which had leopards and all sorts. But when I was doing the sound edit, it, I loved it because it was all in the city and I could put all this in and you have people chatting, you have radios going, you have the sound of trains going past or subways. And there was one in New York, which was the same thing. And I do realize that there are places which look like complete wildernesses, which are possibly not quite like that. I mean, to be honest, I won't know exactly what they're like because I just get the picture <laughs> and uh, I can I have to um, track lay what I see if if I saw any people in the picture then there would be people in the picture but I said most of these places the recordings I very rarely actually have to take humans out of it because of where they are um, so um, yeah it, it kind of depends on the location but you nowadays I think if there's always an urban program quite a lot of them do and so you can you can show that close proximity between us and the natural world um sorry i missed one from uh, julie do you want to read do you want to read yours julie or do you want me to uh, read, read it um i can read it i've got my camera up is that okay yeah do you hear Fine. me yes yeah. Yeah. thank you um, I loved seeing the Pro Tools file at live, Kate. Thank you for sharing that. That's a right. <laughs> and I wanted to ask you, what's your process for differentiating between those three types of files and your Pro Tools sessions? So you had the green atmosphere, the blue effects, the pink purple foley. And yeah. so how do you as an editor um, what's the process for differentiating between them? And are there moments of crossover when it's hard to call? Which would be which? Absolutely. Um, very good question. Their effects, um, uh, which for natural history tends to is calls and close up, it's close up sounds. It's all the close up sounds which tend to be mono, and mono works best for anything you're focusing in on. It's having a big stereo um, track, which is quite wide, of something that you're looking at sort of um, close up will just be turned back in, will be t will, the mix will make sure it's mono. So I like to lay out mono effects, they're much more directional. And so with effects, um, I tend to start with mono effects, 
which are your close-up ones and what things you're looking at and as it goes sort of down from effects one two three four and then it'll go down and the kind of the ones that are maybe out of shot are further down um so sort of effect because i can see i've got effects nine pet nine ten which are stereo effects but they're usually ones which are a bit more atmospheric they may be calls but they're they're not what you're actually looking at and then to go on to the atmospheres which will be wind insects um background birds um rain and when i do it i do like thunderstorms this is when the crossover is is thunderstorms for me and things like wave crashes um i always put those in the atmospheres um, although there are mono tracks in there and they can, it is, it is, can be quite effective. Like a big wave crash will have, I mean, it could have up to 10 tracks on it. So you've got the background waves, you've got the close up, you've got the bassy sound hitting, you've got the spray sound. So that's, it is kind of like an effect, but I tend to put those into the atmospheres. This is a lot to do with how the mixer likes it because when they when they premix they kind of premix everything and then you come down to it um, before you get to the final he'll ha he or she will have a, f a few um faders which will have some will have the effects on and some will have the atmospheres so they don't have to negotiate going through the whatever it is 30 tracks that i've got everything is in a block so all the effects are on one fader all the atmospheres are on another fader or the folio on another fader so it's a way the mixer can kind of control stuff so when we get to the final mix again we really want to hear the effects but we need to, because we've got say we've got music we want to back the atmosphere is down so they can just they can just pull down one fader and all the atmospheres will go but you've still got all the effects which are there and so focused in which means the music can, it doesn't muddy you're not muddying up the music with atmospheres so it's a way of kind of controlling everything during the final mix and the foley is is its own thing and the foley is all mono and um i kind of like it gets shot and then i bring it into my session so i know what the foley is covering and uh, if there there may be things that I can um, do better than Foley can, like a, you know, if a tree falls down, it is much better if I get the sound of a real tree falling down. I can get real, you know, the sound of tree tree creek or wood creaks and do all that. Foley can do some of it, but it's a combination. So I think does that explain it for you, Julius? Sort of how, the breakdown. Yeah, that was brilliant. Thank you. Yes, um, I'll explain. I'm I'm doing some documentary stuff with ambisonic sound, and so it's all with all native audio. But I kind of have the same issues that you have, but with a slightly different situation. So thank you. That's really interesting. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think the the next two questions that are on the Google Doc that I've got in front of me are from Hal. So I don't know if Hal, do you want to just uh, read them out as opposed to me, you know, translating for you? Uh, that should be good. I feel that. Oh, his Wi Fi's gone. Okay, cool. I'll read them for you then. Okay. Um, Thank so, you. Uh, so, yeah, there's, there's two here from Hal. So, um, when field recording, what are the precautions that you take to ensure that you're getting the results that you need? Right. Um, as I said, I do some field recording, but not that's not kind of my profession. But when I do go out, um, the, th the biggest thing is to record enough of it. So if you're recording an atmosphere, um, don't set the mic up, walk away, and then come back sort of 30 seconds later and think that's done. Because, and this is, I'll just tell you what we get from some sound recordings, which are quite frustrating, uh, is um, my, there'll be a whole lot of mic handling, a setting up and going, this is here at dawn, a walking away, with chat and then someone sitting not far enough away chatting and then coming back again going right that was it that was 30 seconds <laughs> and again utterly useless there's nothing i can use the most important thing is to um once you put the microphone pointed it in the right pointing in the right direction is to record long enough so a sound editor because if you know say a plane goes past or someone starts talking that's absolutely fine if there's enough of it that a sound editor can edit out those bits because that's the joy of sound editing if you've got 10 minutes of it and there's about five minutes which are useful perfect if it's 30 seconds and there's three seconds that are useful this is nothing no of no point whatsoever that's very important and um 
uh, giving idents is very important because either um, you can log them as you go, but that quite often can't happen. So the best thing is to either put an ident on the front or an ident on the end of the recording. So at some point when someone is listening to it, we have a hope of knowing what it is. Because there are especially when everything really, if you you can hear a sound, but I won't necessarily know what it is. If you're out on location and you're there, you will know exactly what it is. So definitely idents are very important. There are things which are uh, tricky like wind and stuff which it's it's all to you know get a wind gag um try and put it out of the wind a bit realize that it's probably better to record something even if you feel like it's not going to be great than not record it at all because now we can eq a whole lot of stuff out there's a whole lot of ways of cleaning up sound recordings which in the past obviously when i worked on film and really up until about five six years ago we couldn't clean up and the the noise reduction that we can do is huge so if you've got something and say there's maybe a generator but it's quite far off and i've heard people record say i go we can't use any of this because there's that generator i go no no keep going because that's a constant frequency we can you know get rid of most of it and if something useful is left that's brilliant so i think that's all i mean the whole kind of mic um what microphones to use, that's not my expertise. I mean, what I've mostly found is if you, if you can hear it well over headphones, if you make sure you've got the level right and that you're not listening high on your headphones but recording low on the actual whatever you're recording onto, that's important because we sometimes you get a lot of low level recordings and it may have sounded great during, through the headphones, but that's because your headphone um, level is up so high that sort of thing is is good to watch and i'd say if anyone's going somewhere they haven't been before is to or not use the equipment is record stuff in your home or out in the garden or out in the street before you do anything and then you kind of know how everything is working and then if you can import it or send it to someone to listen to they go yep yeah, that's fine so that's <laughs> um, so someone's asked a question about sound libraries in the chat and the next question is, is kind of like uh, related to that but um, mm -hmm. so uh, uh, Lisa if you feel that it, like you, your question hasn't been answered by this one then you can just um, chime in after but uh, this is also from Hal. So, so how vast is your collection of sounds for wildlife? Are there any publicly available resources for accurate wildlife samples and field recordings that we could access as students? And as a follow-up question how often do you need location recordings for sounds that aren't in your archive? Uh, which I feel like is kind of related to Lisa's, but at uh, least, yeah, feel free to. Yeah, um, we have got a huge library and um, it's sort of, some of it is um, CD libraries, some of it's stuff that you can, you can buy. Um, it's a long time since I've um, done that. What's tricky with sound recordings is um, we do rely on location stuff a lot because if it's location we know we can use it and it's exactly right and that's fine when we go to back to our library we have to check stuff um to make sure it's it's accurate for where you know the location um I, it's very difficult with sound effects because there's a sort of a, a gray area of copyright because a lot of them you know some being recorded 30 years ago no one have any idea who recorded them and there isn't really a copyright thing um usually if it's not for um broadcast then you can kind of i mean sound editors are usually the best place to get sound effects because we just hoard them they come in from all sorts of places and you know for decades we you know we have just gone that's great and no one else is going to archive any of this if there's been a documentary which has been there used to be times years ago when libraries were properly archived but it doesn't happen anymore and hasn't done i'd say well over 20 years um so the only people who archive sound is sound editors and we kind of are in charge of them so how if, if you're working on something that's broadcast then the you kind of have to sort of talk to sound editors like me or the you know anyone else and see what they can sort of hand over it's, it's sort of, as i said it's a gray area <laughs> but you can as i said most of us sound editors, we just talk to each other and see like have you got that if it was something recorded say for something a very specific um channel or broadcaster then be very careful about not using that on another channel 
and if they're sound recorders who've got that who like building up their own library we don't use theirs unless we've got permission from them so sound recorders are also good to go to for um location sounds was that the end of the was there another bit of that question i can't remember sorry um it was how often do you need location recordings for sounds that aren't in your archive oh um always yeah um it's it is it's, it's just what it is um what we like to get best it's not, you have to remember all these films that they're, they're completely mute so what you saw the meerkats there is no sound that's actually mm. sync with that picture um everything has to be created so if we get it just makes it so much easier when you've got location sound because as i said we know it's right we have still have to go through it and work out you know is that cool the right bit for that place and i will make sure you know if it fits its mouth it's, it's there's a whole lot of you know sync that has to happen i can have all sorts of calls from chimps doing war box or whatever they happen to be doing but because it's not shot at the same time i still you know i have to get these calls and edit them and it's the right call but i have to make sure it fits the lip sync mm. so yes location recording is entirely important unless it's based in a spaceship which yeah, do sure. whatever you like. <laughs> um, so that's that's the sort of questions that I had on the Google Doc. But if anybody has any like thing that they're desperate to ask or anything that's like come up from answers to the questions that you like want to follow up on, just like I don't know, say something in the chat or just start speaking. Like, um, but if not, I'm not. Yeah, I don't know. Any? <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, there we go. Sorry, yes, I was got, gonna... um, John. Yeah, okay. So, John also, uh, John Gordon, who's a technician, also has a technician and teacher of sound editing, has some questions, I think. So, oh, um, hi. Hello. Before hi. you go ahead, um, Lisa, are you, have you had your question answered? Because um, I feel like there's a slightly, all right, great, okay, lovely. Okay, hi, John, nice to see you. Hi, um, should we have Lisa first, and then we'll have John. Okay. Um, I just wanted to ask a question. Um, I think it's on the Padlet, but I forgot what it was. Um, I don't uh, I have it open. I've got my eye on the Padlet. Let me see. Uh, I've, I can paste it into the chat for you, Yusuf, because you okay. put your name after. Okay, yeah. Um, in terms of composition and sound design, what is the mindset you have when creating a soundscape or a musical piece for documentary film. I feel as if the theme and scenes can vary so much from action to more karma scenes. Um, how do you diversify? I think that is kind of the joy of what I do because everything, even within one show, there are very different sequences. And because I have worked on dramas and horror films and everything before, um, you, and, and anything really, it is a, um, each sequence is its own thing. So you, if it's quiet, you have to be, you know, make sure the sounds are nice and intimate and close. But you know, with like really specific birds, I think it, it's there's lots of different things you can do. You can make something very quiet but very detailed. You can go for the big bang, which is like big sound effects, sort of coming with you know big sea storms or sort of. Um, sharks attacking things you can use big sound effects for that basically you're totally led by the picture you have to be led by the picture everything has to connect to that picture which is why sometimes sound effects can work better than music because we are every movement something is making we are looking at the movement going right does that make a sound and if it makes a sound what sound is it making do we make it so it's adding drama if if two if in this, uh, I'm trying to think what's the, if you've got sort of horned animals and they're doing that antler thing, you have to think like, how far away is it? Is the whole thing about how loud that noise is, or is it something going on in the background and you're actually slightly talking about something else? But you, you just look at the drama of the picture and go, right, this is all about those antlers hitting. It's about the amount of weight that's going behind those animals. So as a sound effect said, you go, right, what is important is you need to have you need to have weight, you need to have impact, you need to have some higher frequency stuff in there, you have to have the low boom. Because our sound effects quite often have to pass, go through music as well. 
but you still want the impact of the effects. Every sequence is completely different and it's, it's not just one mindset, it's our job. You look at it as a whole, you see where the story is going and your job is to help illustrate the picture and the story. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Um, hi, Kate. Thanks for um, uh, this afternoon's hi. lecture. That's, that was so awesome um, to, to hear you speak and, and see the, the track lay to um, the, you know, the Natural History Programme. That was really cool. Um, I guess um, I've got, I think, well, I've got one question. I think maybe you, we've kind of, you've probably answered a lot of this in a way, but what, what, I, always, what I always find one of the hardest things when I'm editing sound is um, step back in do i believe it for, for the purpose of the effect that i'm choosing so you said about putting the right sound in the right place and how you can quite easily get into a kind of uh, sort of way of editing where you just put in loads of sounds into the track clay and maybe that doesn't benefit the the soundtrack at all um so i guess i think you were just talking about it there but i just wondered is there anything that you do or you've, you've picked up or is it just experience over time that, that makes you know that's the right spot effect yeah. or the right bit of foley for, for the scene? How, how, how do you go through that process to pick the right sound? Um, I say definitely to do with experience. I can actually remember when I first started a new layout. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Um, you could, it's to do with having confidence in what you're listening to. It is all to do with that when some sort of as assistant and I've seen other a sort of sound editor when they first start you have everything there I mean and you go well, why have we got five different quiet winds going because no mixer is going to want to hear five quiet winds they're all the same they're not adding anything but it's you need to have the confidence go yep yeah, that is the one that works and it is all to do with experience you start looking at a picture and as you say you can sit back and go that feels right. And the, I mean, for me, the best thing is when people who've come back from location listen to the premix before the music's on there or anything, and they go, it sounds exactly like being there. Even though it's, as I said, it's more of a best of, because there'll be, you know, there'll be more bird calls, or, you know, distinctive bird calls than maybe you would have heard for that sort of 10 second shot. Yeah. But it makes you, but the people who've been out there come back, believe it, and it makes you feel like that. But it is all experience of that, knowing that you don't need kind of five similar things. I and mean, because as you look to the my track day, there are times when there's only two atmospheres going and, and that's all you need. Um, even for, I mean, it's easy to use 5.1, but sometimes we do, Dol you know, the home Dolby Atmos. And as long as you've got enough to cover, there's nothing amazing what one stereo track or two stereo tracks can do. Um, if they're right, you don't need all the rest. If you had a jungle and you laid up four jungle tracks from the same jungle, it would sound like the muddiest cacophony ever, and it just wouldn't sound right, it wouldn't sound real. So if, say it was a jungle, I would have the lovely birdie jungle track, and the, the things I would add would be things like an insect track. So if you're pointing downwards or you're right down in the undergrowth, you hear all the jungle, but you hear the insects. And then when you go up, you lose the insect. It's quite good losing stuff. If you move away from somewhere, you don't have to add the sound that's following that picture. You take away what you've just got, what you've just left behind, and that will that will make that makes the geography work. So removing stuff also works. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I did have a, and just a second question. Um, I'm, at the minute, the, the unit I'm helping teach um, on is, is a Pro Tools sort of delivery. Um, so to get some of our students, they, they were, they're hopefully going to be able to well, they'll be taking the certification to, to, um, to be like Pro Tools 110 sort of certified, wow. which is great. Um, but um, I think, I guess my question is like, what, just to kind of share maybe why it's, a, why is it such a synonymous tool? Like um, and like, I, I know it's for people to work in teams and work professionally with each other and have sort of a editing protocol where you deliver something that somebody can take that and a mixer has a certain way of working and he's going to expect things. So I just wondered if you had any anything to kind of like explore and add about that as why that's such a tool that people use and and what uh, maybe that's just a trying to sort of highlight that for students because yeah. teaching it. 
what's quite interesting is when everything first started going digital, everyone had their own favorite. Apart from Audiophile, which was the first one for uh, sound editors, everyone um, in this country and on the east coast of America used Audiophile. And then we moved on because it, it's a great tool, wasn't particularly sophisticated. And then in between that, there were lots of different um, platforms. And at that point, it got all a bit confusing because you were going into mixing theatres that had one platform. You may be sound editing on another, which meant everything had to be turned into, uh, what was it called before? It's now an AF, but it, so you, it, everything had to be kind of converted to something else before we get into anywhere else. I'd say America uh, and the West Coast probably uh, led Pro Tools. And when we started working for America, because I quite often just send track layers off to America, and this happened, I don't know, 15 odd years ago. You know, if you send a Pro Tools session to, at the time, at the West Coast, they can open it and it looks exactly the same as you've got here. So basically, it was just a, it probably came from there. This country had started using it, but not all dubbing theatres were using it. And it just became a, a, an industry norm. I mean, I know there are some people who much preferred other platforms, but really there's a kind of, um, it was a, a wave. It, sort of, it, it was just going to be what it was going to be. Pro Tools is what uh, most mixing theatres use, what people across most of America use and uh, in Europe and here. So in the end, it, ha it I mean, it's very good for Avid, um, but we've, that we all kind of used um, one platform. So that it sort of, it just became because that's what more people had and that's sort of the way it goes. I mean, for me, I really like it. I have tried other platforms after Audiophile and I find they were too base for mixers. It had so much information kind of around the edge um, that I, it was just too complicated. And what's quite nice about Pro Tools, you can really simplify it. I never have the mixing page up. I can level adjust, I don't need to see all that. So you can simplify it and it's sort of, I can see what I'm doing, which is most important. <laughs> so that's its kind of history of why we've ended up with Pro Tools. Brilliant, great. Well, thank you, that's, that's awesome, thanks. No that's problem. All my <laughs> okay. Thanks so much, Kate. I think, yeah, sharing your Pro Tools um, kind of, edit was really great for a lot of people here especially those learning pro tools and john yeah teaches um yeah and helps the students get through that that exam cool. no. that yeah no, very glad to help <laughs> i had um, to learn it without being taught it but i've got lots of experience with it <laughs> yeah it was amazing to hear about how you started off editing video well as a receptionist and then editing video and then kind of i guess gained all the skills yeah. in a really, in a very embodied manner just learning as, as by doing um, yes completely by doing yeah and it was all on film so I was going to used to cut cut 16 mil on 35 yeah it's a very different experience I think for young people learning um sound editing and all every, all different sorts of things related to that today there's still a couple more questions on the Padlet I don't know if anyone wants to claim them um and ask them um, I'm going to put the link in for any of the students who can access that and there's a couple which are anonymous so I don't know if anyone wants to claim those questions. I had one just about um, um, what you described as the kind of battle or I wanted to know a bit more about the relationship you have to producers and I was really interested in the kind of battle between the kind of sound effects and the music. And my pet hate when watching kind of nature documentaries such as the ones that you work on is when when they just like you know kind of slather on loads of music over the top and when you were showing us your your pro tools edit i was thinking oh i wish they just did a version which had no talking and just I know. <laughs> no music with that if they did i guess it would be like a director's cut on the on the dvd or blu-ray or something without because even without talking it's completely different obviously you want you want the information that comes through yeah. the narrator's voice at times but it was also really amazing just to listen to it because so much goes into it and there's as like the detail that you said like it's only ever the exact right call of the right animal from the right time of year you know that is so impressive that the the kind of minutiae of all the different sound is taken that seriously and it's nice to know that it isn't just kind of a, oh we just you know grab any old yeah, that's really. Nice. But, um, yeah. 
yeah it would be interesting to hear a bit more about those battles and the relationship maybe with different with the producer or with different producers mm -hmm. regarding um, sound effects versus music okay well it's um it is always it's not always a battle it um and some producers prefer lots of music uh, right the leg i'd say what the legacy is is when um they're in the edit um because they haven't got it's not sync and they haven't got a full track lay on it when they're doing lots of viewings is obviously during the picture edit they're viewing to executive producers they're in uh viewing to channels they're sort of uh the broadcasters um in the olden days <laughs> years back um they didn't have to have lots of music they could virtually watch a mute film with maybe some guide narration and then that would be fine they get yeah, it's fine but that doesn't happen there's so many layers of people who have to watch the film that music gets put on very early on even if it's temp music it's library music just to sort of go well this is a sad sequence this is a dramatic sequence um so what but once that's been put on in the offline edit when they're cutting it's very difficult for people to say oh no we'll just take it away even though I know what I'm producing is going to cover it all. So it, it can become a bit of a, um, it's just become very attached because there's nothing like music to kind of drive everything on. And they go, oh, it's fine. We can keep the shot going longer because we've still got music going. But there are producers who, and it, it's more so now, some still just love lot, just lots of music. This learner orchestra has to be going all the time. And if that's what they want, that's what they want. And there is nothing I can do about it. I can have my, like, put my little hand up and go, maybe come down a bit. Um, and mixers do that as well. So there's always a, a conversation about that when you get to the final mix. There are some producers who are now kind of moving away from that bit, allowing sort of space to hear all the effects, to hear where you are before you get into music. It's very difficult to do a whole, that were 50 minute natural history without any music at all because there is emotion that has to be taken on and quite frankly on aerials there is only so much i can sort of put in <laughs> that's always the worst thing we get given an aerial go oh we can do loads of sound design over that game what <laughs> we're just very high up but um so there's lot there's always there is place for music i think um it's horses for courses some producers um like it sort of virtually all the way through and I just have to fight my corner and go like could we just push that a bit and some have got um, in a way braver and just said no we can do we can have that whole sequence without anything so it's it's sometimes it's a lot to do with the channel it's to do with the broadcaster it's to do with the producer and sometimes the producer will know that that particular channel goes for kind of big music but I do know it's a pet hate of virtually everyone who watches natural history but i have no choice in it i i mean obviously because we've always said it would be lovely if you had a little red button and it would just play um the effects but that hasn't happened yet but i'm sure mm. anyway so yeah it, it is it's a it's a constant sort of thing but i so said we are we do try and talk to the compose composers i mean bleeding fingers were which have done lots of stuff i've worked on are great and they kind of they're really good at doing underscore and so you know effects can come to the fore and there's there's just something running along underneath which is that's good so composers sort of because they don't want to compose music that's not going to be used or is going to you know not going to work so there, there's probably mm. more collaboration than there used to be but it's um that's above my pay grade to decide exactly how much music there is going to be it's just sort of mm -hmm. we do our best and basically we create something that as far as we're concerned would work perfectly well without any music at all because everything is covered there isn't a bit we go oh, we don't have to worry about it because there's music on it everything is there for that moment when someone goes i think we've heard enough music can we drop that piece or can we hold it down and there isn't the fear that oh my god there's not going to be anything there there will always be something there. well there should always be something there Mm, well, that's nice to know. So in the future, if there is a big red button, as you said, where we can take away the yeah. music and the voice, <laughs> and the sound effect will be perfect. Um, I, what else was I going to ask? Oh, yeah, just because um, you mentioned about um, working on a horror movie and how much kind of creative license and almost how much pressure there was then to create the drama through the sound and what you've been saying also um i think 
shows that there is a lot of drama that can be created through sound, albeit through fairly subtle means, which is why the music is often quite um, aggravating because it's a kind of big dollop of something that could could perhaps, at least in certain parts, be created quite subtly. Um, mm. So yeah, that was just a fascinating contrast, I suppose, between working through the very reality-based, you know, what's on the image is what you have to kind of help um, recreate through sound when you're doing something to do with natural history. And then on the other hand, um, horror movies where you can kind of be quite fantastical and, and creative um, in terms of creating the drama. Um, so do you still, do you do, my, do you do any of that I've, side of things anymore or is it kind of moved towards I haven't, the... done, I haven't done a horror film for a while. There's always some, like, there's usually little films that come in and you go, oh, excellent, there's kind of, um, there's people talking and there's sort of something gruesome going on. I, I said I haven't done one for, for a proper full-size one for um, ages, but they are... In a way, the skills you've got to create drama in anything, it kind of, that what a horror film does is you don't have to base anything in reality because it is what it is. I mean, even if it's horror or fantasy or whatever. Um, and with that issue, you have to have attachment to the location. But there are, so you have to look at how the pitch is, what the pitch is doing. If something goes into a major slow-mo, you have to, the effects can't be completely naturalistic because it would be for a start out of sync and would feel wrong for whatever's sort of um, been tried to put across. So the skills are kind of, they're the same. You're just using different elements. Uh, you know, as I said, sort of creating the, um, the robot being put together, that was little servo mo motors being slowed down and um, uh, sort of resisted and stuff. And we kind of recorded those and used those. But those, but once you know how you can manipulate sound, it's, it's the same for that as, creating the noise that goes underneath a big wave crash so it's a big thump and you go okay if i slow that down a bit then that will create the nice bassy element to it so it's it's all the same skills um but you know some are just more dramatic and more well not no more dramatic just different and um you as a sound edge you have a huge palette of sound effects and if you haven't you try and create them because there's lots of things you can do. There's nothing like slowing something down or make, turning it backwards and putting reverb on it to make it suddenly become an interesting sound. So mm -hmm. that, <laughs> that's kind of, I mean, I, there's things I've slowed down before, which actually works best slowing down on audio file. Lion rules slow down. If you really slow them down to, um, it's like those are times, it's fantastic sound because you get impacts, you get actual impact sounds. So anyway, it's, it's kind of, the skills are the same you're just looking at a different picture i think mm -hmm. great thank you um lisa has got a question i don't know lisa if you want to come on the microphone or if you want me to read it out for you steve's posting some numbers i'm not sure what that's about steve <laughs> um sure lisa okay so lisa um is there a particular lisa hall asks is there a particular moment of sound in your work that you're especially proud of or pleased with that you can share with us? I your oeuvre. <laughs> I know, it, it kind of changes all the time because when you, you do one and you go, oh, I really like that bit. There are times, um, there were bits on um, oh, Blue Planet 2, which I was particularly pleased with because they worked so well. I think there was a bit when a whale was um, under the water and it was been it was a really long sequence of being eaten by sharks and there wasn't a huge amount of music or that because the producers didn't it was sort of quite underlying music but as i was saying about um i could see every tail flit and what i was looking at was the movements of the sharks as they were coming in biting stuff off rather than just well if you just look back at it it was sort of quite murky with this carcass of a whale just been eaten by sharks but if you watch their moves they're, they're sort of you could see the muscles going down their bodies as they and I try to kind of articulate those with sound and it was you know the sounds weren't sort of huge particularly different but because I gone into every single detail of every move it made it made it very dramatic and meant you could sit down and watch it and the producer was so happy with it she said i was because she said it was really important to see how long and how much um 
the, you know, see these sharks taking this whale carcass apart. But she was, I think she, at the time she was worried it was too long a sequence. But once you put that much detail in it, you could just sit back and it just means your eye is caught. Because I just look at it as a whole. And if I see something moving on the right hand screen, I can write, I can put sand in there and it draws your eye. And you know lots of stuff is going on. So that is that sort of secret. It, it changes all the time. Because I do one program and I think, oh, well, that worked really well. Or, you know, and, you know, there's ones on Tiny Worlds, which is out on I've got to say Netflix, I think it is. Um, but that's quite interesting stuff. With sort of, it's all very intimate and um, lots of little sounds which sort of work. So there's lots of them and it sort of changes from one year to the next depending. I mean, sometimes I get sick of underwater. I go, I never want to do it again. <laughs> and then I have a break and I love doing it and then I'll get back into it. So, um, yeah, it changes all the time. Mm, thanks. Yeah, that's an amazing anecdote. I mean, I guess that's probably why it's so crushing if the producer then comes and says, oh, we're going to slap loads of music over the top of that. And you're like, no. I know. Um, I, know. I mean, that's why it's good to have, have the discussion with the producer because there are usually sequences like that and they go, we're not sure which way, should we go with the music? And I go, it's okay, I think I can do something with this. And then they could, so there is a backwards toing and froing mm -hmm. before, before mm -hmm. the final mix. So that, that always, Great. that's good. Thank you. Um, anyone from, there's a couple of questions on, on the Padlet. I don't know whose they are. I can read them out um, if, if so. And they're anonymous questions. So let's let's give those ones a go. Um, I guess a lot of them you might have more or less answered, but someone has written, it's pretty much universally agreed that wildlife documentaries such as Blue Planet can be as exciting as dramas. Um, how much of this do you feel is down to the sound, both in terms of Foley and also the music? Is one more important than the other, or is it in perfect tandem? I suppose that's just what we were talking about. Yeah. Also, um, I'd say Foley is a very different thing from sound effects. It's always like Foley is something that's recorded over one or two days. What I do is, uh, is sort of actual sound effects. So the Foley is sort of an add to your sound effects and your atmospheres. Just it's only because I know people sort of put have suddenly sort of get in calling Foley everything, and it's not Foley is a mm. very specific bit which is recorded mm. against picture, um, and then and that's an add to everything that we as what sound editors do. Okay, I mean maybe this one relates because um, this person has asked how would you go about creating sounds for animals, um, unlike when doing Foley for punches and such there is a certain creative license is there a certain method for doing it is any recording done on set at all um with the foley is that's the only thing that's recorded sort of what i suppose you call so in a studio and that's because sort of all the close-up moves um i said it's not recorded sync and it would take weeks to fit sort of find a recording of a say a meerkat walking around and make it fit every single bit so all the foley is done on every natural history and lots of documentaries and always has done has done since the beginning of sound um on tv and film and so you look at it and they, you know everyone's got um foley artists go in they've got trays which have got grass they've got gravel they've got sand they've got lots of different surfaces they've got lots of um sort of elements which will help create the sound. So, you know, if a, if a meerkat or something runs past a hedge or bush or something, they'll make a noise for that. I can actually, I've probably got sound effects for doing something similar, but we cover everything on Foley, every little movement. So it is just the movements. There's no, you don't do any calls, you don't do any atmospheres, it's just literally the, the close-up movements as well. And with water, um, I, some foley is water foley is done if it's very if it's small and sometimes it can work for bigger stuff but i tend to use the real sound of um splashes even if they're quite subtle actually i prefer stuff that's actually been recorded outside and is real water and so i will lay that up which is my kind of thing is doing water because <laughs> i like it to be real so yes so there's lots of there are lots of techniques and doing foley is is a whole thing in its own in its own right, the artists who have to, are going from people who are fairly artists who just do two feet to do dramas, and then them getting to do four legs is quite a thing because it's a it is a skill you have to learn doing four legs. Mm. I guess it's a question of kind of specialization. It might be interesting for kind of the young um, 
students and kind of aspiring to work in the industry um, in various ways. Uh, we had another guest, I can't remember who it was actually last term, who was just talking about, you know, when you first start out, you just do everything yourself. And the kind of bigger the productions you work on, the more specialised each of the tasks Absolutely. is. Um, yeah. um, the division of labour, I guess, becomes more and more complex. Um, I had well, a question... Well, just about how, um, but it would also be good to, I guess, give the give the students a bit of insight into, um, yeah, these different roles and maybe what they entail or how they might go about yeah. making a decision of what to specialise in. And then my my thought line was a bit more curious about how you think the industry has shifted over previous decades, because then you obviously it says in your bio that you've been doing Netflix and. Uh, Disney Plus and all that and I guess previously yeah. all, all of this was um, a lot more dominated by the traditional um, channels so um, what sort of tips would you give I guess for um, young sound editors or I would designers? say don't special yeah as a sound editor don't specialize too early in a way what happens is you tend to get pushed one way or the other I used to love doing dialogues I mean it's a kind of methodical sort of thing and you've, you've got all the sound in and I used to love doing it and I do love working on sync um, on as you said on bigger productions something like a drama or a feature film you'll have one to two dialogue editors with and sometimes well in the olden days when there was film you'd have assistants as well so and you'd have say two effects editors two dialogue editors plus two assistants and sometimes more depending on the size of the um, production and you'd have a Foley editor and you'd have a fo and like one or two, usually two artists. And so it it's all very separate. If you get onto really big productions, you could be an effects editor and be told all you're doing is um, fire, uh, all you're doing is car doors opening and closing, which I think would be mind numbing, but sometimes it goes like that. But it's, uh, but ne don't, never narrow yourself down as a sound editor too early you tend to just go for the jobs that are there and sometimes you may get a reputation as being particularly good on sync or particularly good at dialogues or like effects was my thing and I just kept going with that and so I tend to do more effects than I would do dialogue I said I don't get to work on um dialogue with um, features for dialogue anymore so but I think if I was ever going to I would still be end up doing the effects side of it and sort of Foley, being a Foley artist and you know you do get Foley editors and lots of our when we've had tra trainees and you know our assistants now the people who start at Buffalo in fact the first thing they get to do is fit Foley because it's there's a lot of sound there it has to be accurate you don't have to search out sound effects it's all recorded there but it has to fit absolutely spot on it's a fantastic way of learning the importance of sync and having your ear tuned in because sometimes if you put something early in a foley it sounds wrong it can be two frames late and it would be absolutely fine so foley editing is is a very good training way but as i said you never narrow yourself down to saying you're going to do one thing or the other if you can get into any sound if you learn pro tools really well understand that what you're doing is looking at a picture and adding to it you're sort of facilitating what's what's needed for producers and you're making whatever you're doing good for the mixer to be able to mix and for them to go you know not go what the hell is that or why is that out of sync um sync's very yeah it's but yeah i'd say just don't narrow it down too quickly because you may decide you've done some sound editing but actually what you prefer doing is sound recording and I do some of that. It's I think as a sound editor, as I said, I haven't done that much, but I have done some. It's very important to know for a start how difficult it is to do sound recording, but also how you can uh, tell people who are out there recording what you actually need. Because there's obviously sound recorders who've never done sound editing in their lives. Um, so it's very good to explain to them, right, it's no point getting all this because this is of no use to me. I, I need these specific things and this is why it's useful. But it's, I think it's good to try as many different things as possible. And also for your own projects, go and record stuff and just use those as sound effects. Just if you hear weird sounds, record them and put them into an edit. Yeah, great. That's really good advice. And what about in terms of um, changes in the industry in a kind of bigger sense have what have you noticed or observed over past decades that might might be of interest to um people getting into into the industry i think it's um i think it's let me think 
it's kind of settled down. I mean, working for different organisations, actually, as a sound editor, your job is exactly the same. It's in fact exactly the same whether the we've been mixing mono or going to Disney or anyone. It's the same process. And a lot of the times, you, you um, nowadays you don't. Well, I've been freelance forever, so I've never attached myself to any specific company. The work comes from wherever it comes from. The process is the same, and a lot of the people you'll be working with will be exactly the same. It doesn't matter if they, they work for lots of different companies, and so will you. So it's that part of it hasn't changed. But I think um, I think women are coming in more now, which there was a great big break when there was virtually no women. When I started, there was you could be an assistant and that was didn't matter what gender you were everyone could be an assistant and so everyone could get on to be a picture editor effects editor, sound effects editor and then what happened when it went digital um it became boys with toys and i could only tell there's a certain age group um probably between about uh, 35 and 45 so a bit younger than me, where there's virtually no female sound editors, but now they're all coming, they're, everyone's coming back in because everyone's used to using computers. It's not a big deal. And so, and software is not sort of, it is for everybody. So I'd say that's the only thing that's changed. I think the whole process is in fact exactly the same. There's new te technology, there's new, you know, there is things like home uh, Atmos, but the actual practicalities of it are the same. So I don't think it's changed that much. I said the only difference, but this was so long ago, is that we don't have official assistants anymore. But that kind of went once it all started going digital. Mm. So right. fascinating. Um, great. OK, well, I think we're coming towards an end unless anyone has any final questions from the students or any of our guests in the audience. Your final chance to ask Kate any questions or you, John or Michael, please feel free to go ahead. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, okay. Kate. Um, so fantastic to have you. It's really hard to get people to come and talk from industry, actually, because I guess you've just got enough things to do. Um, as opposed to kind of coming and talking to students. So we really, really appreciate you taking the time and sharing um, some of your experiences and your workflow with us. So thank you. That's absolutely very, very fine. Much. It was an absolute pleasure. And you know, got to give back. I've been doing this for a long time and there's like people have to, you know, it's good to share as much information as I can really. Well, thank you very much for doing so. Okay. okay. Right, well, we'll wrap up there. Um, can I just ask the uh, students to stay behind, um, so BA and MA if possible, um, and we can say goodbye to everyone else. Okay, just so I just... MA students. Okay, Perfect. so I just... Thanks so much, and I'll be in touch um, just to tidy up a few things with you.